came off of this morning's discussion. The I forget the guy's name, but the old the old guy that's like has the stroke, but going <laughs> into that, and we were talking about conversion disorder this morning. Could there be a component of that if he didn't actually have a stroke and he's you know sometimes able like when when she's doing like that voodoo stuff, like he's able to speak again once he's like you know has some sort of psychological aspect to his stroke stroke symptoms. I think that's kind of interesting. And again, it, it wouldn't be out of the context to understand that um, cerebral vascular disease, history of stroke, would have a psychological component or context because every illness does. So um, in this case, this particular neurologic illness, if we are taking the report that he has suffered a stroke to be true and reliable. Um, again, not beyond the scope to understand that there is going to be perhaps even a significant psychological component uh, to his illness, to his CBA. Uh, now, on the other hand, if a neurologist were part of this movie and understood or provided the medical opinion that what we are seeing is not due to the effects of the stroke, Again, maybe the vascular distribution is just different than what the CT or MRI has showed. Uh, then there might be more going on. That is, in terms of this particular psychosomatic illness, the somatic component doesn't appear to jive. And therefore, the psychological component is likely more influential in this particular person's presentation. Right? So, um, how comfortable are we in understanding, well, I know the ending is the ending. How comfortable are we in understanding that he did not, in fact, did not suffer a stroke? Where's, what's our opinion? What's your opinion? Well, I thought, like, an interesting concept is, like, I, it was my impression that he was given this, like, poison almost, that, like, from, like, you know, he was, like, given poison, like, every day or whatever. Um, but Caroline, like, the nurse, I think, her perspective in terms of like the voodoo stuff was like the like how much she believes it, and I remember the like the one scene where she's uh, like after she goes to the laundromat, she goes and she says like oh if you believe like in the voodoo stuff then you know like if you believe that the voodoo is causing your symptoms then like by that same logic if you believe that the like treatment of voodoo like should also work in theory. So it's kind of like, if you believe that this is the cause of your symptoms, then the, the treatment should work by the same, like the treatment should be the same. Oh, great. Like Non-medical uh, treatment should work. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna expand upon this, I think significantly so in just a little bit. Uh, and that is this role that's uh, root work or spells or hoodoo is playing in this particular patient's slash character's presentation. Um, absolutely, and that's going to be a primary focus of what we're about to get into. Any other thoughts here about his quote unquote stroke? Could there be like an aspect of like Munchausen where he's been made sick? Yeah, right. Not right. Trying to get money or Correct. And we probably now should uh, rework this algorithm that we expanded upon in morning rounds. And that is when a patient presents to you with any chief complaint, in this case, perhaps dysarthria, we'll, we'll take a symptom from our fictional patient. Um, I think the first step is to acknowledge that this gentleman is suffering from a psychosomatic illness. Uh, we're not saying anything groundbreaking here, since every single illness ever described has both psychological and somatic components, every illness is psychosomatic. So not that big of a stretch here. On the other hand, if upon, in this case, a neurological workup, including CT scan, there does not appear to be any somatic component to his presentation, the only thing we can do as a practitioner to help our patient then is to really focus on the psychological determinants of behavior. If the somatic part of psychosomatic is not helping us out, the only thing that might would be the psychological aspect. At this point of our clinical 
reasoning, the term psychogenic is often used. So from the focus or from the perspective of a psychogenic illness, a psychogenic illness is any illness that is any psychosomatic illness for which the somatic component really has not been discovered. That's it. So our, is it Ben? Ben, right? Uh, ben seems to, uh, at least in terms of the information provided us through the script of Skeleton Key, be suffering from a psychogenic illness. Right? Brief pause. Any questions about kind of the algorithm we're working here? We're, we're OK. In this step, and this is not something you would necessarily actually say to a patient, but you're going to ask yourself, is there any evidence that our patient is lying? Because if the answer is no, we're going to shift in one direction. But if our answer is yes, we're going to shift in a completely opposite direction. So yes or no? Do we think Ben is lying to us? No. No, there's no evidence. And with no evidence of a lie, the baseline should always be that they are not lying. So you will never walk out of a room, look your attending in the eye and say, Dr. T, I think he's lying. That's not, th that's not going to be the case in clinical medicine. We always work from a position that the patient never lies until it's discovered that they are. And if there's nothing in this script, if there's nothing in Ben's behavior suggesting or even confirming a lie, then he's not. If there is no lie in place here, then we have to consider this to be um, his reality, his experience, and therefore our differential will include somatic symptom disorder as well as conversion disorder. And it's one or the other depending on what symptoms Ben has. If it's voluntary motor or sensory function, we're going to call it conversion. If it is anything else, we're going to call it somatic symptom disorder. So at this point, what do we think is going on? Yeah. I agree. So this looks to be a case of conversion disorder. One final piece to the puzzle here, and that is when we think about people trying to or making a conscious effort to deceive us, we have to expand beyond the patient themselves. Caregivers. Is there any evidence of a lie here? Yeah. There is. So even though conversion is a provisional diagnosis, we have to now explore that other part of the algorithm where the patient or others are intentionally misrepresenting the symptoms. In this case, unbeknownst to Ben himself. Right? And that's the role of, is it Virginia? Violet. Violet. Violet, I'm sorry. When we look at Vi uh, Violet's behavior, we have to think this may be a form of factitious or malingering. There's our differential. The two, quote unquote, lie syndromes are factitious disorder and malingering. Now, malingering is no longer in the DSM. However, it's still a clinical term very often used to describe deceitful behavior. But then again, factitious disorder, which still is classified in the DSM, is also um, deceitful behavior. What differentiates one from the other? Intent, right? What the motivation is. So what's the motivation or intent? And the, the clinical term we hear that is synonymous to all of this is called gain, G-A-I-N. Motivation, intent, gain. Uh, gain is the clinical term. So what is the gain of factitious versus malingering? Exactly right. Internal or subconscious versus that conscious effort to deceive slash external. That's it. Again, baseline, we always consider it to be an internal conflict. For example, the sick role, until proven otherwise. Again, I don't care what you feel towards your patient. I don't care what your suspicions are. Unless you have evidence of some kind of external incentive, it's not going to be malingering. Uh, until it's proven that it is. Is there any evidence that there is some external incentive for Violet? Uh, I mean, my 
my my loose understanding of the plot is that <clears throat> she needs to keep these bodies around so that she can stay alive forever. So I think that's her game. Immortality is a game here. Yeah, yeah. So this seems to be malingering, albeit not malingering in Ben himself, but what we might be might be construed as malingering by proxy, uh, or malingering imposed on another, which isn't a thing, not uh, not in medicine anyway. The legal system, law enforcement, absolutely. But that would be the working quote unquote diagnosis, even though it's not a real diagnosis. And that Violet is malingering by proxy or as imposed on another, specifically Ben. Uh, and that's the algorithm here. Questions about how we kind of sifted through Ben's ailment? We're good? This should allow, again, if you, if you practice this, this algorithmic approach, this will allow you to really tease out four diagnoses. Somatic symptom disorder, conversion disorder, factitious, and malingering as a two and two differential. In one case in which the patient is caught in a lie, factitious and malingering, and in other cases when they are not. Somatic symptom disorder, versus conversion disorder. What else about, what else about Ben? Anything else here? Even though I agree, this looks to be a case of malingering in a character other than Ben. From Ben's perspective, why not a mental disorder that is substance-induced? Because she's clearly giving him something. So that, that might be another way to think this, albeit through Ben's perspective. That is a substance-induced, perhaps cognitive disorder, or perhaps even psychotic disorder, in as much as we might interpret his difficulty communicating as a sign of psychosis. So that's another consideration here. All of the above, everything we just discussed, whether it's going to be through Violet's perspective or Ben's perspective, all must be itself weighed against something that might be culturally uh, bound or culturally sanctioned, which is where we fold in this southeastern practice of hoodoo or root work. Right. Again, we're going to get to that in just a little bit. Anything else you care to discuss? Anything else you observed in, in, in Ben's character? What other characters do you want to discuss this morning? Well, I think going off what you were saying with the psychosis thing, originally when I was thinking about it, like the ending of it, how like they switch bodies and whatnot, I was like, well, this, how can this be like psychoanalyzed? It's like kind of like a, like a magical fantasy thing. But if you think about it then, if, um, I forget like the, the nurses, I forget everyone's name, but like the nurse's name. Um, Caroline? Caroline, yeah. If she like they didn't actually switch bodies, but if there is like some psychosis going on where they're believing into this that they switch bodies and then she takes on like a new personality. Like I don't know what disorder that exactly is. Let's talk about that. Yeah, that's something interesting. So Caroline presents to you with a chief complaint of a feeling of depersonalization, that subjective sense that she is not quite herself. Um, this is, that is this clinical term is contrasted to derealization the subjective sense that your immediate surroundings are unreal in some way. If either becomes clinically significant, depersonalization, derealization disorder may be your single best diagnosis. Right? So that's her chief complaint. When you ask her, which I hope you will, tell me more, she then discloses to you the plot of skeleton key, that she is really not in possession of her own body. Uh, instead, it's a slave from the 1800s. And in discussing her experience of reality, her belief is fixed. That is, a, a long discussion, she does not provide any insight that this is a breach in reality testing. What clinical term now might apply to Caroline's thinking? Psychosis in general, and what clinical term within psychosis in particular? Delusion. Exactly right. Now, 
So delusional disorder or a larger psychotic illness incorporating that delusion become part of our differential, right? So now this line of reasoning is putting us into the schizophrenia and psychotic disorders chapter of the DSM. So it looks like she's struggling with a delusion and it looks like her delusion is clinically significant. It's causing Caroline clinically significant distress or impairment, right? I think that's pretty clear in this film. So what are the different themes or subtypes of delusion? There's, persecution. There's, there's five plus one, or five plus two. Religious? Uh, not religious. No. Supernatural? Closer. We're going to call it grandiose. So the acronym is JPEGs. Jealous, persecutory, erotomanic, grandiose, and somatic. Um, all are fairly self-explanatory. What is erotomatic? What's the erotomatic delusion? Is it someone in love with you? Like the, 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 like the stalking or celebrity is the one that's commonly associated with it, right? Exactly right. Uh, which is not depicted in this particular film, this particular fictional case study, but it's the one that sometimes you have to kind of pause and think through. I think the others, um, jealous versus grandiose, et cetera, are relatively straightforward, okay? Um, again, we're talking and we're focusing now on uh, Caroline. Uh, by the way, sometimes our patient's behavior simply doesn't fit into one of these artificial categories. If not, we call that unspecified. And sometimes they actually overlap, we, uh, so mixed. So those are the, that's the plus two, but I think that's intuitive. It's unlikely you're gonna really see either of those terms on your shelf exam. On the other hand, you might be presented with an unspecified delusional disorder in your clinical vignette, but instead of seeing delusional disorder comma unspecified, answer A for example, you might actually get another term altogether because these unspecified forms usually take the name of the individual, usually neurologist, that originally described them. There are three very common examples, rare disorders, but common test questions. What are those three conditions? Three forms or three examples of unspecified delusional disorder having taken proper names. Good. What is the Capgras syndrome, often referred to as the Capgras syndrome? Everyone um, you know has been replaced by an identical clone. Everybody got that? It's the imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. An individual, usually someone close to the individual struggling with the delusion, has been replaced by an imposter or clone, the imposter syndrome. Two more. What is the Cotard syndrome? C-O-T-A-R-D, Cotard. Is that the opposite where you think you've been replaced or something's not real? Very close, been replaced. More specifically, you believe you or part of you is dying or is dead. Cotard syndrome. And the last one is the Fregoli syndrome. Fregoli. Fregoli is a variant of Capra, where the individual believes another person has the ability to shapeshift and can take the guise of others, right? For goalie. I do not think Caroline demonstrates the for goalie or Capra. However, the delusional belief that a dead slave is impersonating her body might be for goalie. Or in a context, if it's not, if the focus isn't on death or dying, uh, it might be a form of, although it, it would be a variant of Capra. That is, it's not that I believe someone close to me is really an imposter. It's that the slave is possessing me. It's a little bit of a loose association here. I think it's more Cotard syndrome in as much as that she doesn't believe that she's in control of her own feelings, et cetera, that it's, she's someone else. And, and sorry, you said these were like is isolated delusional Unspe unspecified. Unspecified. Yep. So would that also then be the same for Violet as, as well? Like yes. That would be kind of the same exact thing. Yeah. yeah. 
hysteria? That's a tough one. Um, this, this idea of shared psychosis or shared psychotic disorder is something we'd have to consider here. Right? Shared psychotic disorder is a disorder that is incorporated in an individual that is in, pro in close proximity to another individual with established mental illness. So it's a shared delusion. One's delusion becomes shared with another individual, usually someone who is in very close proximity or in a close relationship with the index case. That could, that could be the dynamic working here. But there's, again, a larger context to this, which we always have to get back to, and that is, is it really shared psychotic disorder, or is this just a, a typical practice, a sanctioned practice or belief system of a given area, uh, an area now that Caroline lives in, resides in? Remember, we talked about this this morning, and we're going to talk about this as we approach every, every patient, every film, Psychiatrists always start out, step one, believing whatever it is that is, is being reported to them is normal. Let's say it's normal behavior until it's not. And we're always going to get back to the role either religion, spirituality, or culturally sanctioned beliefs play in a patient's presentation. That's always got to be the initial consideration. And once that is disproved, then we move off that starting spot to our next step of abnormality. Yeah, yeah. So when assessing gain, when as clinicians we are trying to de deduce what motivates human behavior, in this case, what is motivating abnormal human behavior, uh, the idea here is that it's always internal. There's something always that is internal that is being satisfied, and therefore the gain is always um, of primary or secondary gain. Right? Primary and secondary are both internal or subconscious gain. Um, we don't actually say that the patient is being manipulative and is lying to us for external reasons until that external source is discovered. So until we see that there's a multi-million dollar lawsuit for a workman's comp claim, we, we, don't, we don't gravitate to that external incentive. Uh, irrespective of how much we might suspect one exists, until it's discovery, we always give our patients the benefit of the doubt. So it's, it's a practice of just the way I think doctors in general should be advocating for their patients. So it's always in, so first of all, your patient is never lying until they are. And the motivation or gain of that lie is always internal or subconscious until it's not. That's just a way to practice medicine, right? And you know, if you did it, if you actually applied that here, um, I understand that if you were a physician, if somehow a physician was written into the script of skeleton key, it may have, that line of reasoning, albeit patient-centric, may have put blinders on you that could have resulted in your death in this movie if you didn't suspect, right, Violet the whole time. But so what? The physician doesn't make it. At least they're ethical, right? They'd be a hero in this movie, uh, at least from our perspective. Uh, so um, there, there is some risk to it, but keeping, your pati uh, keeping it patient-centric uh, is really the way I, you, know, you have to be trained to think. Uh, horror movies, it doesn't always work out for the physician. So be it. Other thoughts here? Other characters you want to discuss? So I think the idea of a, you know, a quote-unquote shared hysteria, group hysteria, uh, more specific, shared psychotic, uh, shared psychotic disorder also um, expands to our lawyer as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, all three sitting in the room would tell us that they are not who we, they appear to be, right? So there might be an element of psychosis with him as well. Uh, I don't know. I mean, he's very manipulative. Um, and again, 
So let me ask you, um, when either, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave the choice up to you, when either uh, watching, observing, Violet or, is it Mr. Devereaux? How do they make you feel? The, uh, the, the lawyer and Violet, did you like them? How do they make you feel? Anybody want to share? And uh, again, I want you to be honest. I don't want you to say, oh, well, at the end of the movie, dot, dot, dot. I, I mean, you know, beginning, beginning of the movie, as the plot unfolds, how did they make you feel? Well, the, sorry, the lawyer, you know, I mean, he, he at least, he appears to be a confidant, you know, or someone you could trust for most of the movie. Uh, Violet or the, you know, the wife, I mean, she, can, she comes across as a little bit suspicious throughout the movie, at least to me. So she came, across, she came across as suspicious. How did she make you feel? Uh, like, she, well, like she had something to hide. I mean, you know, from, from the beginning she said, you know, don't go up in the attic, don't go up in this room. There's just kind of always a sense of there's something she was withholding. So I felt blank. Fill in the blank. Uh, mistrusting. Mistrusting. I felt... Well, Caroline's perspective, your perspective. I want to know how you she feel. Hot, I mean, she seemed hostile. She, she, okay, she was hostile. How did it make you feel? Mm -hmm. So by, and we, we talked about this before. The most difficult question medical students will ever be asked, and the most difficult question they struggle with the most, is how does it make you feel? I mean, these guys are like, you know, 80, 90th percentile on national board exams. They can answer any question except that one, <laughs> right? It's like pulling teeth, getting a person to, to tell me how they feel. Right. How do you feel? I trapped that feeling. I, clearly. <laughs> I, I, worked, I worked on Wall Street for 10 years. I have a lot of <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> that's a, that's good. You got me there. Anybody here going into psychiatry? So not, not yet. You haven't seen the light yet. Oh, of course. I'm, I'm not going to pip my resident on how she, uh, how she feels. Uh, that was up to her, her medical school. Uh, um, advisors and mentors. Um, they creep me out, right? I mean, um, Virginia, sorry, I'm calling Virginia. Violet made me anxious. Uh, she, she really made me anxious. I, I, was, I was identifying with Caroline. Uh, I was certainly, again, identification here is a defense mechanism, uh, but it's also that normal reaction that we usually have when we pay $50 to go see a movie, we become the character for those two hours. It's, it's a magical moment. It's identification. Um, so um, she pushed my buttons. Uh, there's a voice in the back of my head that kept on saying, get out. And it didn't help that Caroline was from New Jersey, right? This is no place for a, little, a nice New Jersey resident. Get out. <laughs> so anxiety, anxiety was very heightened here. And by the way, uh, it, was a very, it was a shared feeling toward the lawyer, too. Um, uh, I was very distrusting of him as well. He made me feel anxious. I was frightened. Absolutely. Um, that's called countertransference, right? When in psychiatry, when we have these quote unquote negative feelings conjured in us, it tells us something about the person sitting across from us more than it does ourselves. There's a reason why they're pushing our buttons. Now, this might prompt us to investigate an external incentive. This, this might be our warning sign. This may be that red flag that says, that we should search for an external incentive because I think they're lying, and there might be an external gain to this. There might be an actual external conscious incentive. Now, if you took that line of reasoning and investigated it, you would have found out, maybe even before the end of this movie and those mirrors were set the way they were, that immortality was on the line, meaning my, my life was on the line. But if you missed that countertransference, then you missed examining that, and you may have been in the exact same situation as Caroline at the end of this movie, and I'm sorry for your loss. So don't ever ignore the feelings that other people conjure in you, right? Because that's your body's internal alarm system warning you that there might be something going on with them. It's called countertransference. And it, it's not only, uh, or it not only occurs in real life, but it occurs while you watch fictional lives as well, in film.
How did it make you feel? It's a very common question you should ask yourself. I wouldn't do it with the people you're watching the film with. Right? After the fact, it's going to get you to watch a lot of films alone in your life if you did that. But very important question nonetheless. Thoughts or questions about any of these characters? So after all of this, unfortunately or fortunately, I'm going to ask that you dismiss it all and revert back to our original impression and that all of this is normal behavior. And the reason why is because of the role of hoodoo or, excuse me, root work. That is, and this is the tagline of the movie. I mean, the irony here is that throughout this film, despite being from New Jersey, that Caroline begins to believe. And that's a necessary step for the conclusion of this film. The irony is that if Caroline didn't believe, she'd have been safe. If she was bigoted and prejudiced and was rigid in her belief system, it would have saved her life. That's the irony. But she wasn't. She came to believe that hoodoo works and that hoodoo is real. If it's real to you, tagline of this movie. It's also a very important core principle to culturally sanctioned beliefs or syndromes. And these appear on your exams. Now, when on a shelf exam, the single best answer is a culturally sanctioned belief. There are two things to look for. 30% of the time, maybe a quarter of the time, they may ask for the actual diagnostic label of that culturally sanctioned belief. Who do with an H or root work is an example, hence why I made you watch this movie. Who do or root work is the, is the practice of spells that is indigenous to the Southeast United States. If you visit the Southeast, if you're a locums, or if somebody from the Bayou region of Louisiana visited New Jersey where you work and talked to you about this, normal behavior is your single best answer. Which means that while I may have asked you, what's the name of this? It's hoodoo. I'll, probably one in four chance I would ask that question. 75% or about of the time on a, on a shelf exam, they're going to ask you what the next best step is. And you need to not only recognize that this is culturally sanctioned, but therefore it is normal, nothing further to do. So nothing further to do will be your answer 75 or so percent of the time. The remaining 25%. The question stem may actually ask for the specific name of the belief. In this case, hoodoo. Questions? This, uh, of course, underscores the importance of taking a social history, the individual's culture and geographic location of origin, what their practice and belief system is, and how much it might relate to their current behavior. Without that understanding, you may have made the misdiagnosis that this was psychotic. But again, if you start off from a, at, a, at, a, at a point where the behavior is normal, irrespective of how it looks, incorporating information to move off that first step, well, as you're starting with that perspective, when you begin to think of culturally sanctioned beliefs, you're never going to move off that perspective. Choice A, normal behavior. What's the difference between a culturally sanctioned belief or syndrome versus a culturally bound syndrome? Culturally bound like only occurs in certain contexts, whereas the other would be like something that comes from that culture but can apply to aspects of their life that are outside of it. Um, somewhat, but I think on, especially on exams, that, that is more times than not the common thread, that both situations are usually geographically isolated to a given location or culture. So it really doesn't differentiate the culturally sanctioned belief from the culturally bound syndrome. What does differentiate those two? One is normal, as we just spoke, uh, spoke about. The other is abnormal. So culturally bound syndromes are syndromes that are culturally bound. They are bound to a geographical area or culture. However, within their culture, it is considered to be abnormal behavior.
Who remembers this morning's discussion of Seifeld? What does George do before going to the hospital? How does he get his ailment treated? It's kind of like a holistic uh, person. Is that Tor? His name right? Remember if you're calling his name? Because <clears throat> when we are introduced to Tor, he says a couple of things that I, I want to know if you picked up on. He was providing his CV, his background, <laughs> to both Jerry and George, perhaps even Kramer. I used to live in the Arctic. Remember what he said? No? Yeah. What, what, what happened up there? More? Uh huh. Remember? Again, I'm going to paraphrase. Um, they, they have this behavior where they run outside and they stick their head in the snow. It's right in the script of Seinfeld, right, the heart attack. What was he describing? The answer is a, a culturally bound syndrome that could appear on your shelf. It's called piblocto, otherwise known as Arctic hysteria. If someone from the Induit tribe traveled and deplaned at Newark Liberty, and did the same, well, our snow's gone, but did the same thing, they may end up being transported to APS right, right down the street here. But once on call with me, you took a full history and discovered that they are actually from Alaska, from the Arctic, where this is considered to be completely normal, you would discharge them with nothing further to do. Piblocto Arctic hysteria as an example, well, I should say nothing further to do, Nothing further to do in the context of, of urgency. This is a culturally bound syndrome that is even in the Arctic area. It's considered to be abnormal. Culturally bound syndrome. Piblocto Arctic hysteria. There are other examples that, albeit, are not, were not covered in this morning's Seifel discussion, but nonetheless still appear on shelf exams. Anybody have any ideas? Anybody here ever see the movie Predator? Instant honors right now. Raise that hand. No. Nobody saw Predator? Oh, man. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll, I'll go from the closed-ended back to the open-ended open question. Any other examples you know? Any other clinical labels? Any other diagnoses of culturally bound syndromes you've heard of? Like yes. Yeah. Your personal favorite is Atake or Atake de <laughs> Atake de Nervios is uh, indigenous to Central and South America, Latino. It is often described um, along both psychological and somatic complaints, with each being very consistent with what we understand to be a panic attack. Uh, and as a panic attack, the somatic complaints are largely cardiovascular in origin. However, there's one that is often, I think, specific, and when it comes up on shelf should be the identifier that atake, atake de nervios is the single best answer, and that is the sensation of heat starting in the chest, right, cardiovascular, and rising to the head. When you hear that, atake. There is a variant of this called susto, or I think it's S-U-S-T-O, which is very similar, but exchange out the cardiovascular for the GI. Same locale, same geographic locale, susto, what Again, signs and symptoms of what we would understand to be a panic attack, but exchange out the cardiovascular and insert GI symptoms and you have SOSTO. 
Others? Those are, you're saying, are culturally bound yes. syndromes? So they're abnormal in the... Abnormal in um, Latino cultures in Central and South America. It's all based on chi yeah. and, and the misdirection of it, and therefore the redirection through ac either ac acupuncture or acupressure, right? Mm -hmm. Any others? What's the DOT syndrome, D H A T? So it's the delusional belief of um, you losing your sperm uh, and therefore somehow dying from the inside out. Uh, it, uh, similar belief, albeit outside of India, Koro, C-O-R-O, -O, which is different than Kuru with a U. This is with an O, C-O-R-O. -O. Very similar belief in terms of Aspermia uh, resulting not only dying from the inside, but even more specific, localized to the genitals retracting and then becoming gangrenous. Any others? What is brain fog? Fog spelt F A G. Brain fog is usually experienced a cohort of students where they have various symptoms that seem to significantly impact their ability to study. So, difficulty concentrating, confusion. Dysphoria. Uh, I believe it's localized to the African continent. However, again, with uh, industrialization um, in 2022, uh, what appears on tests indigenous to Africa does not necessarily translate to real life. Any others? One culturally bound syndrome, I, I, we could kind of um, end the conversation here. So again, being culturally respectful, um, there are other countries outside of the US that look at our 50 states and understand that borderline personality disorder is culturally bound to the US. So there's a completely 180 degree opposite perspective on this. What appears on our US medical student shelf exams and then what appears on everyone else's. Right, so um, consideration of DID, that's dissociative identity disorder, and borderline personality are culturally bound to the US. Not likely to appear on your exam, uh, but certainly could appear on any international med uh, medical student examination. Any final thoughts on our film today, this morning? Skeleton Gate. Now we're good. All right, we'll end it here. Break for lunch. We'll come back with Night's Watch at 1230. Thank you.